That right there was a man who read the Word of God and loves the Lord so much that as he was reading it, it was just breaking his heart and ministering to him. you got to love that. If you'd open up with me to James chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17 this morning. The topic, although I'm one that doesn't really like to put uh, titles to messages so much, for some reason it's just something I don't like to do. The topic is certainly the will of God. Why don't you pray with me and ask the Lord to bless this time in his word. Lord, we thank you so much. First, I just want to thank you for our Pastor Sharp, that he's able to be with us this morning. Thank you that his health and his strength is coming back, and we pray that you would continue to uh, do that work in him, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the wonderful truth of your word that we can place all of our weight on. It It never moves. It's always solid. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit and that we can understand your word and that you speak to our hearts and into our lives and you correct us and direct us. Lord, please minister to us this morning. Help us to hear from you. We thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Read with me. James chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. In these verses, James addresses the huge and sometimes dividing topic of God's will. The way you view this topic has sweeping influence on nearly every aspect of of your theology, your walk, and your life. In my experience, I have found that many Christians fall into one of two extreme camps. Those that give too little or no thought in their lives to the will of God, and those that have a view that paralyzes them from making decisions and moving forward in their lives. James gets right at the heart of the issue using the plans of some business-minded believers as his example while giving some instructions for how a Christian should view God's will in the light of their lives. Look with me at verse 13 again. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, Buy and sell and make a profit. These travelers, these planners are are putting together the dates of their trip. Today or tomorrow we're going to leave. They're considering where they're going. (laughs) James says to such and such a city. They're making considerations for the length of their trip. We're going to spend a year or so there. They've plotted out their goals. We're going to go and we're going to buy and we're going to sell. And finally, they're plotting the outcome of the trip. We're going to make a profit. The planners. You know, things haven't changed all that much today. Although these planners, they were more than likely the kind of nomad salesmen who would go into a city bringing goods from the city they just left. And while they're there, they seek to sell all of the goods that they brought that are foreign to that city while buying goods from that city that they can go sell to the next one. And they would go from city to city and make a a circuit. And at the end of the circuit, they'd end up at home with, you guessed it, goods to sell there. And this was pretty common 
in these days. Now, as you know, I've been a traveling salesperson for years, so I can kind of relate to this. I go and I look at the map and I see where it is that I need to go and, and, and I set up some meetings and I buy some plane tickets and I book some hotels, I get a rental car, of course all with the approval of my manager. And I look at this and I say, I've made these plans a hundred times over myself. It looks a little different, but it's basically the same. So as I look at the planners, I say, what's wrong with making a business trip plan? What's the problem here, James? I do this all the time. It's not the plans in and of themselves that James has trouble with. You've just started to get to know me in a what is he going to do here way. But as you could tell, I'm kind of a planner. I, I kind of, you probably don't even know to the degree that I'm a planner, but I'm very much a planner. And, and I plot things out uh, quite a ways in advance. And, and I, try to, I try to look in the future and, and, and determine what direction we should go, right? It's not the planning that's a problem. It's not making a profit. It's not buying or selling. None of that's the problem. But there are three little words in this passage that, that really set the tone of correction or why James needs to correct. And those words are, we will go. We will go. The we will go here highlights the tone of self-reliant, self-focused, Self-motivated planning. Self. We will go. What did Satan say? I will be like the Most High. I will do all of this. I will ascend the mountain. I will sit on the throne. All of his own plans. It's the heart of the attitude that James is addressing. Not the plans themselves, and not the idea of making plans. As a matter of fact, Scripture would actually encourage us with wisdom, with reason, to, to plan things out. There's, there's wisdom in that. It's not the plans. That's not the issue. The issue is this. Does God's heart matter? Does God's Plans? Interrupt our plans? Are we okay with that? When we're seeking to make plans? Are we thinking about His will? Or is it always about our will? Now within the same context of God's will, James points out the foolishness of these planners with the statement in verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. As much as we have advanced in technology, we still can't see the future, can we? We are still stuck in the here and now. We can't look ahead. We just keep moving along second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Never being able to see what's right around the corner. Proverbs 27.1 says this, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Have you ever had that experience? Today the sun is shining. All is right in the world. You just paid off that last credit card bill. You still have money in the bank. All the tires on your car are still inflated. Your wife is smiling. Your kids are playing. Everything's wonderful. And then tomorrow comes. The storm clouds show up. You get a flat. Your wife is upset with you. Your children are fighting. You just had to empty the bank account on an unplanned un, uh, expense. Life can change in a second. In a millisecond. You do not know. 
what tomorrow will bring. But this is not so with God. In Exodus 3, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? God said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am speaks of the, of, actually of several attributes of God, the least of which is his eternality. God is outside of time. And actually, he's the only one outside of time. Oftentimes, not intentionally, unintentionally, we seem to view the next life as actually being eternal in the sense of outside of time. Like, we're stuck in time here, but when we leave this time, we move into a timeless realm. That's not truth. You move from this time to another time. You will always be in some form of time. The angels are in time. They're not seemingly predicated to our time exactly, but there is a correspondence with our time and their time. Remember Daniel? I tried to get to you sooner, but I was kept by a fight. There was a war on the way here, and that caused time and our time. Only God is outside of time. The angels don't have the ability to peer into the future. Satan doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He does not have that ability. You and I, as much as we'd like to think sometimes we do, you know, everybody likes to forecast what's coming. Forecast. As a salesperson, I get asked for a forecast every week. What are you going to sell next week? And I always want to say to them, Sorry, my crystal ball broke yesterday, so I really don't know. But they always want us to come up with something. You are always trying, we are always trying to figure out what's coming. Oftentimes our prayers are not, Lord, I want your will, but Lord, what does tomorrow hold? Tell me the future, Lord. Tell me what's going to come. Has it, have any of you had the experience that God actually told you? Good. Neither have I. Uh, not once. Never had. Never happened. He's not a soothsayer. Matter of fact, it's strictly forbidden for us to ask to see the future. But God knows the future. And he's the only one that does. He sees it plainly laid out before him. And there's, there's nothing hidden from him. Nothing. Not one thing. Not the intentions of our heart. Not the words you're going to say. He, think about this. He knows the very number of the hairs on your head at every exact, exact second from now until the very day you die. He knows everything. Every little detail. And when we presume to know, what are we actually doing in that? We're trying to be like or make ourselves God. And it happens easily. These planners are going about this plan and thinking, presuming that they can figure out or know what's going to happen tomorrow with no thought given to God. God is not in time. And this attribute is completely unique to him. God alone can say, I am. Because as soon as you do, you were. It passed. God is the one that is always constant. He is always the I am. I get super angry when I see that used. And it's, it's, it's like such a blasphemous thing when people take the I am and warp it. 
God is the only I am. Now look in verse 14 as it continues. It says, for what is your life? Hold on. (coughs) For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Finally, in the context of God's will, James reminds us of the brevity of life. We can easily forget how short life really is and how little time we really have. David prayed in Psalms 39, he said, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as a hand breath, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best, at his best state, is but a vapor. At his best state, a vapor. You know, the thing about time is that time is relative. Good times move fast, Sad or boring times move slow. Early years crawl. Latter years fly. But for all of us, time keeps marching on. And once it's spent, you can never go back. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. Just like David, we should pray to have an awareness of our limited time here. Not something we usually want to talk about, right? We usually like to think that we're going to be here for a long time. Especially those who are in their early teens in this room. Wait till you see the numbers I throw up in just a second. But here's the thing. When we understand the brevity of life as believers, it should have a real positive impact on our Christian walk. Consider that the average life expectancy today is around 75 years old. Now that's America, right? But we live in America, so those are the numbers I'm dealing with. That's, oh, go back. That's 27,375 days. And that kind of sounds like a lot, right? But in comparison to history, history has had 2,190,000 days if we're just looking at 6,000 years, which I am definitely a young earth person. That equates to, listen, 0.0125% of time that has existed. That's your your slot. You have 0.0125% of the time that has already been spent. That's a flash in the pan, people. That's all that is. If I had a hundred bucks and I said I was going to give you 0.0125% of my money, would you care at all? Oh, thanks. Woo! What is that like? 0.01 penny? Now, especially when you take into consideration what the, the time the average American spends on things. 25 years sleeping. 2.5 years cooking. That's a picture of me, by the way. I do cook, right, honey? Not as much as you and not as good as you. Yeah. 3.7 years eating. This is Pastor Sharp. He loves hot dogs, conies. Sauerkraut. 1.1 years cleaning. This is Joanne. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? 1.5 years in the bathroom. You thought I was going to put something else, didn't you? 10.2 years working. That's Mark, but Mark's numbers double that. 4.3 years driving. Of course, this is Rick Bills and Kathy. 9.1 years watching TV, and I'm not going to say who this is. And if you take one year, or pardon me, if you take getting dressed, doing yard work, waiting in lines, 
and sitting in traffic, that's a whole nother year of time. If you add that all up, that's 58.4 years of stuff that you just got to do. That leaves you, kids, with a whopping 16.6 years or 6,000 days that you need to decide what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? If you have 75 years to live, you have 6,000 days, essentially, that you get to choose to do something with. It's not a lot. If we were at .0125 for 27,000 days, I didn't do the math, but it's a whole lot smaller. Life's short. Life is short. Recognizing the brevity of our lives in light of eternity must have an effect on how we as Christians go about doing life. Recognizing the brevity of life must have an effect of how we as Christians go about doing life. And that's what James is trying to get us to recognize here. Verse 16 calls any other attitude. It says, But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. If we take the approach on the brevity of life as believers with anything except God's will matters, James is calling that evil. That's evil. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? I love the simplicity of James' instruction on this topic. The simplicity is wonderful. And we have three things to consider from verse 15. Three things. Let me read verse 15. He says, Instead, instead of making the plans that way, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? One of the things you can guarantee with James is he's going to put it down to very simple, just basic, do this. Just do this. If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Now this reveals the heart we as the children of God should start with. Listen, start with as we are making our plans and making decisions in our lives. This is where we start. Number one, we must acknowledge Him as Lord. Notice it says, if the Lord wills. We must acknowledge that He is Lord. Christian, that's where you got to start. Is Lord, is Jesus Lord? in your life today? Does He get to rule over those 6,000 days? Are you willing to submit and lay those down? Is He Lord of your life? Now acknowledging Him as Lord, we need to recognize that His will should be directing our lives. His will should direct our lives. Christian, is that how it works in your life? Does he have that authority in your life? Does he get to call the shots? Does he get to tell you no? Does he get to tell you go? Does he get to say to you Speak. And for a lot of us, does he get to tell you, don't talk right now? Does he get to direct your life? If he is Lord, that means he should be directing your life. 
Anything else is evil. Anything else is evil for the believer. Number two, we must acknowledge him as Lord and recognize that we must submit our days to him. He says, if the Lord wills, we shall live. And this has several meanings, doesn't it? One, recognize that your life is in his hands whether you submit to that fact or not. He holds your breath in his very hands. Do you make your heart beat? Do you make yourself breathe? Does anyone here have asthma? Anywhere here dealing with asthma? My dad deals with asthma. He says, Adam, it's a really scary thing when you have to remember to breathe. You don't think about those things. And you can't add one day to your life. And frankly, I'm not even sure if you can end it before he allows it. God holds that in his hand. Now submitting to it brings great, great things in the Christian's life, but it's a reality either way. But it's beyond that. You've got 6,000 days, for some of us less, for some of us close. What are you going to do with it? Are you willing to submit those days to the will of the Lord? Are you willing to commit those to Him? Guys, we do have everlasting life to look forward to. Giving up these days here, it's not all you got. As a Christian, this is really our opportunity to lay at the feet of Jesus the thing that is probably, if we recognize it, the most valuable thing we can give Him. And that's our time. That's our days. And when we lay that at His feet here, He is going to repay you tenfold in the next life. Because you can't outgive God. You can't outgive Him. Finally, number three, we must acknowledge Him as Lord and recognize that we must submit our ways to Him. I'm going to expound next week. So uh, we're, we're getting close to being done with James. And I don't know if you guys are like, oh, can we please move on from James? It's been good, right? It's been good. But we've been in James a long time. And uh, I don't want to start a new book this year. So next week, we're going to take one week off from James. And we're going to explore this and a few other aspects to knowing the will of God. It's, a, it's an incredibly important topic. Incredibly important. One that I think that all of us have been, will be, or are a little confused about. But I think that there's some really simple things that we can draw out to help you in it. But it starts here. If you're not here, next week won't help you at all. It won't help you at all. It won't do anything for you. You have to start by submitting your ways to the Lord. What kind of person you're going to be. How you're going to go about doing this life. You need to submit that to the Lord. Any other way is evil. He is Lord. We just have to recognize that. So next Sunday we'll take the topic a little further. If you know somebody that's struggling with Knowing or understanding the will of God would be a good Sunday to bring them or share the message with them later. So I'll close with this. Therefore, verse 17 says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, although this verse can have wide and sweeping application, and I'm completely fine with that, the context of this verse 
fits very nicely within this morning's message to say this. If God is not a part of your plans, now that you know anything but that is evil, for you to do anything else is sin. It's sin if you leave him out. Now we'll see next week, I'm going to give you some really great balance to the conversation. Balance. We need balance, don't we? We don't want to be paralyzed, and we don't want to be uh, uh, ignorant to his plans either. There's a balance to the conversation, and we will make that plain and clear next week. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you really do want to be involved in our lives. You really do have things to tell us, ways to direct us. You're interested in the kind of person we are. Lord, I pray you would help us as a body to submit to you as Lord. To submit our days and our ways to you. Lord, I love you, we love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, two quick things. Pastor Sharp.